Well, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> it's good to see you all. Uh, thank you for joining us here at Fort Street. My name is Garrett Mostowski. I'm one of the pastors here. And I'm Sarah Logeman. Awesome. We just want to welcome you all. Uh, if you're worshiping in person today, thank you for coming. And if you are watching online or however you are listening, thank you for tuning in and thank you for joining us for worship this morning. Just a reminder that things look a little bit different and are a little bit different, especially for those of you that are here in person. One of those differences is that we are not able to sing out loud with our voices, but as we talked about last week, it is an opportunity to worship with the other parts of ourselves, to worship as we read lyrics and listen to music, listen to the music and center our hearts on God. So with that, let us worship. Well, good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Those who take shelter in God are happy. Fourth Street, with our hearts and hands, with silent voices, let us praise the Lord this morning. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Good and loving God, you call us children and cover us with your love. 
and we try to be merciful as you are, to show compassion as you do, but we fail to live the life we have been called to live. Where we ought to forgive, we condemn. The evil we should shun, we embrace. Forgive our sinful ways, tame our outward desires, and give us more, and make us more like Christ until we are raised in perfection on the day of glory. Amen. Friends, the Apostle Paul tells us that while we were still sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. Let's celebrate the love of God. We are forgiven. Amen. I don't know about you, but I can get stressed out sometimes. I can get a little worried that I'm not doing all of the things that I need to do. I haven't responded to all of the emails. I haven't done the schoolwork that I need to do. I haven't done chores around the house. I can feel like I'm failing. And there are other times when I get stressed out that I feel like the world is almost out of control, that other people have lost their mind, and maybe I've lost my mind too. It could seem like everything's swirling, everything's cloudy, everything's messy. It can feel like we're out of control. It's a lot like this, isn't it? I don't know if you can see, but I've got little bits of glitter in there. I made this sort of, you know, the best that I could, but there's a lot of bubbles. There's a lot of glitter. It's a cloudy jar. Sometimes this is what my mind feels like. All shaken up. And look, there's a tornado in there, actually, I, that I can make. That's what my mind feels like sometimes, and maybe yours does too. Everything you have going on at home, everything you have going on in life, all of us who are trying to survive this pandemic. But what I've noticed is that even when things get really shaken up, even when there's a tornado going on inside of our minds, if we just stop and we take a breath and we listen to the wind blowing through the rafters, We listen to the sound of silence. We remember that God created us to breathe. That we always have the opportunity to pause, to take a time out from everything that's happening, to look up, to be thankful. Pretty soon, the tornadoes stop. The glitter all falls to the bottom. The water might still be a little bit murky, but everything 
seems to clear up. As we approach a busy week, whether we're parents or we're children, as we notice the stress and the atmosphere around us with an election coming up, with rising case counts, just remember that God has given you the gift to pause and to breathe, to sit in silence, to think. I would encourage you to use that gift this week. Use the gift of a pause, of silence. Let's pray. God, thank you for silence. Thank you for the ears you've given to us to listen. God, thank you for the breath in our lungs. God, may we know that these are little pieces of grace that have been extended to us. It's a grace to sit and to take a deep breath. It's a grace to have a moment of silence. God, would you teach us to lean on those graces during hectic and strange times. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 through chapter 4, verse 1. Listen for a word from God. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us then who are mature be of the same mind. And if you think differently about anything, this too God will reveal to you. Only let us hold fast to what we have attained. Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ, I have often told you of them, and now I tell you even with tears. Their end is destruction. Their God is the belly, and their glory is their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and it is from there that we are expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation, that it may be conformed to the body of his glory by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, thank you for your word. I pray that you would open our eyes and our ears and our minds and our hearts to the message that you have for us today. In the name of Christ, amen. Well, my elementary school, Mark Twain Elementary in Littleton, Colorado, had good citizenship awards. Maybe your schools had this as well, but when a teacher or an administrator would catch a student doing something good, they would write their name down, and then later at a school assembly, these students would be given a bright orange piece of paper that said, Good Citizenship Certificate. And at these assemblies, their names would be called and everyone would cheer, and it was this great celebration. I remember the first assembly that I went to as a first grader, thinking, what is a good citizen? The whole thing sounded a little bit like a Dr. Seuss tongue twister, Good Citizenship certificate. Try to say it five times fast, I dare you. And I had no idea what it meant. But I started to pay attention to the people that were winning these and the reasons that they were getting them. There was one boy that was lived on the street that I grew up on who got a certificate because he had volunteered to show a new student around the school and then invited that kid to sit at his table at lunchtime. There was another girl that got a certificate because she helped a teacher clean up a mess even though she didn't make the mess and she wasn't asked to. Then there was a fourth grade girl who quietly paid for the lunch of a younger student when she overheard him say that he didn't have lunch money. After a few of these assemblies, I concluded to be a good citizen, at least at Mark Twain Elementary, must mean that you look out for other people and you do things to help them even before the teacher asks. It's not a bad understanding of citizenship, is it? 
but unfortunately, it's not one that we always equate with citizenship today. In this scripture text from Philippians, Paul speaks of citizenship. And it seems clear that this community that he's talking to has a particular view of citizenship because of the culture that they are surrounded by. And as we've gone through this letter from Paul, we've talked a little bit about this city of Philippi. The fact that it was this magnificent Macedonian city that was a Roman colony. That many of the people that lived there were retired Roman soldiers and officers. And understandably, because of that, there was a real sense of patriotism and a nationalistic identity in this community. Because so many of them had come from this military background, there was an acute awareness of status. There was hierarchy, and everyone knew their place. They knew how many stripes they had earned and just who it was that they were better than. To be a good citizen in Philippi meant that you recognized Caesar as savior and king. Perhaps you even fought to promote that idea. To be a good citizen in Philippi meant that you proudly served the interests of Rome and that you paid attention to your place in society. Well, the culture of Christianity didn't quite fit into this scheme, which is why Paul is writing this letter in the first place. These new believers are finding ways that politics and religion rub up against each other in their city, and they're not always sure what to do. Even some who claimed to follow the way of Jesus Christ were finding themselves distracted by earthly things, becoming hyper-focused on their national pride, and claiming victory based on their status within the empire. Many of the people were prioritizing their citizenship in an earthly way. And this, Paul said, was a problem. It's not just the people of Philippi, but for many of us, even today, when we think of citizenship, we think only of national and political identity. This week, I spent some time asking people, interviewing them, saying, what does it mean to you to be a citizen? And as you might guess, because of the week that we are in, the most common response I got had to do with voting. They said to be a citizen means you contribute to society. A citizen is one who makes their voice vote, makes their voice heard, and votes. Other people talked about a sense of inclusion and exclusion. To be a citizen is kind of like being part of a club, if only you are born in the right place, or maybe jump through the right hoops and don't look like too much of a threat. Other people talked about laws and following rules, doing what you are told by those in power. And some mentioned important contributions like jury duty. In one way or another, most of our initial views of citizenship have to do with rights or responsibilities that are related to the empire we find ourselves in. And much like the Philippians, we live in a world where that is tied to politics and country more than anything else. This is why Paul's words in verse 20 are so radical. But our citizenship is in heaven, and it is from there that we are expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It would have been unheard of to think of citizenship as anything other than political, as anything other than Roman. And it would have been taboo to think of a savior other than Caesar. This is why Paul writes these words from prison. Because he has been saying something contrary. 
And Paul knows that to have a heavenly citizenship mindset doesn't just mean you are waiting around for an afterlife. It means that you are actively participating in making earth look a little bit more like heaven. It means that you are not looking to any political leader as the savior and the end result, but instead looking to your identity as a follower of Christ. And Paul admits this might be a little murky, so if you're not quite sure what to do, imitate me. Now, he doesn't say this to sound cocky or full of himself. Paul is always one of the first to admit his faults. But he says, when you don't know the way, look at someone who's a little bit ahead of you on the journey. Someone like me who has made enough mistakes to now know a better way to go. Paul's heavenly citizenship mindset meant that he was in prison, not just this one time where he's writing this letter now, but several times. You know, on paper, we would look at the record of Paul and say that this was not a good citizen by earthly standards. As Stephen Matson puts it, sometimes being a good Christian meant being a bad Roman. So before you accuse people of being unpatriotic, ask yourself which empire they're actually serving. Sometimes to be a good Christian means we are not serving the political empire we find ourselves in. Today is All Saints Day. It's a day when we remember those who have gone before us those beloved children of God who have died not only within this past year, but long before. Today we will remember and celebrate those peoples. We, people. We have glorious flowers here to remind us of them as well. And on this day, we don't just remember these saints in words, but we take time to remember the encouragement that they have left us with. We take time to remember and to be encouraged to spur one another on, even as we are still on this earth. Today, just as Paul encouraged, I am reminding myself of saints who have gone before, who lived as though heaven was already on earth. I'm remembering those people who deserved good citizenship certificates people who brought a little more of heaven to earth, who looked out for people even without being asked, people perhaps who were willing to stand against unjust facets of political empires in order to prioritize the kingdom of heaven. Paul writes this letter to the Philippians and tells them to look toward the saints for encouragement as they continue running toward the goal. Over and over in his letters, Paul uses this running imagery that always reminds me of literal running races that I have participated in. I know that this is about the time of year, maybe just a couple of weeks ago, when services here at Fort Street are interrupted for a Sunday because of the Detroit Free Press Marathon. And Garrett and I have heard amazing stories about this race and about Fort Street's connection with it, with spaghetti dinners and pastors praying before runners take off and bags being collected and all kinds of things. We are both runners and we would love to participate. Of course, the race had to be virtual this year. And at eight months pregnant, I probably wouldn't have been running it anyway. But we would love to do it someday and hope that it will come back in all its glory. But I was reminded this week of a particular running story that I think is what Paul is pointing to. A friend of mine who has done the New York City Marathon talks about this special moment in the race. Now, the New York City Marathon, as you might imagine, is huge and just has thousands and thousands and thousands of people, both participating as runners and watching and cheering everyone on. 
It is a loud race as runners go through all five burrows and people are screaming and ringing cowbells and shouting and encouraging the runners as they go. And runners always appreciate those that are cheering them on. In fact, we run faster and longer when we're being watched and cheered on, which isn't a surprise. But by the end of the race, many runners would talk about one particular moment that was especially meaningful. And the moment that they talk about over and over again is a part of the race where no spectators are allowed. When the runners go over the Brooklyn Bridge, there isn't enough room for all of the runners and fans to be cheering them on. And so it is just the runners. So they go from miles and miles of loud screaming and noise and cheering to all of a sudden being on the bridge and it's eerily quiet. All of a sudden, all you can hear are the shuffles and the plunk, plunk, plunk of people next to them putting one foot in front of the other and continuing the race. But after a while, these runners say that fellow racers will start to call out encouragements. They'll say things like, we got this, you guys, or keep going, looking strong. And one at a time, these voices will pop up in the crowd of runners. By the time they finish, runners talk about that moment and they get goosebumps and say it was so encouraging because there's just something different about being spurred on by someone who's in the race with you. We love to have people cheering us on on the sidelines as well, but when someone who has gone before you and knows how difficult it is, encourages you, you take heart. Paul reminds this group of Philippians that they have a cloud of witnesses to imitate. They have people to follow and to imitate who have taken these steps before them and know just how to have a kingdom of heaven mindset. Paul encourages them over and over to think not only about the political empire that they are in, but the kingdom of heaven, and to remember that that is where their citizenship truly lies. At the beginning of this week, this election week, which is sure to be long and stressful and tiring, we are called to remember that we have a heavenly citizenship. And to have that citizenship means that we take the humanity of all people seriously, even if they don't vote for the person we hope that they will, even if they maybe don't have the right paperwork. To have a heavenly citizenship mindset means that we do engage in politics and in country. It means that we fight for justice when we see unjust systems of power putting black and brown bodies on the line again and again and again. It means that we look with compassion on the humanity of all, that we see one another as beloved children of God we see and we fight for reuniting of parents and children who are separated at the border. To have a heavenly citizenship mindset means that we vote thinking not about what any particular candidate will do for us, but for what they will do for those that Jesus speaks of in Matthew 25. Long before our earthly lives are over, we become citizens of heaven. It's a promise given to us in baptism as we are claimed as Christ's own. We are already citizens of heaven. So what does it look like to live into that? We have the opportunity to recognize this gracious gift we have been given and to participate as citizens, not just in this world, but of the heavenly kingdom, we are called to make this earth a little more like heaven every day. 
So today, I encourage us to look toward those saints who have gone before us and to cheer one another on from the midst of the race we find ourselves in. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, thank you for the gift of your love. Thank you for adopting us and making us your own so that we might know we are truly citizens of your kingdom. Lord, as we try to balance what it looks like to live in a political world and to be people of faith, we ask for your guidance. And we ask particularly for reminding us today of those who have gone before us to show us the way. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Well, as Pastor Sarah mentioned, today is All Saints Day. And All Saints Day, if you're not familiar, is the day when we celebrate those who have gone before us. We celebrate the great cloud of witnesses that make up our faith. We celebrate those that we have loved and cherished, those that have taught us the faith and passed it on, those that have given us grace and mercy, those who have offered us correction. We remember them. It's not just a day to remember them, though. It's a day to remember that we are a part of a larger body, that we are bound up with Christ Jesus and with all that the people that Christ has called, those that have gone ahead. And so we remember those who have gone before, but we also remember that we belong to them. I kind of love that the wind is blowing so harshly today. It almost sounds like that great cloud of witnesses is in here filling up the room, watching us. Will you pray with me? Eternal God, author of our past and promise of our future, we lay down our fears and concerns for the world knowing that you hear our cries. Especially today, we pray for those whom Jesus called blessed, for the poor in spirit, for those who mourn, for the humble and meek, for those who thirst and hunger for righteousness, for the pure in heart, for those who show mercy and those who make peace, for those who are persecuted because of Christ. Pour out your blessings upon them and us that we may be strengthened in every hardship and joyful at the recognition of every blessing. We remember all those who have died, O oh Lord, those who taught us the faith, those who spoke your truth in the face of evil, 
those who died in innocence at the hands of injustice, those who cared for the weak and the suffering, and those whom we loved and cherished the most. Dolores Walker Turner. Richard M. Turner, Jr. Beulah Shokes Turner. Wilfred J. Walker, Sr. Edris Jackson Walker, Mona Graham, Modico Huthwaite, Claudia Nowitzki. Bassi Afyong, Calvin Turner, Wanda Sumner, Jeremy Richter, George Floyd, Brianna Taylor, Manny Elijah Ellis, Tatiana Jefferson. Jonathan Price, Marcellus Stinnett, Ahmad Arbery, and all those that we may have forgotten. Covenanting God, in baptism you claim us and show us how to live. Keep us in your care until our skin turns to dust and only our bones remain. Through Jesus Christ, our brother, our Redeemer and Lord. Amen.
We have a few announcements to share with you this morning before our time ends. We'd like to start by inviting Rob Jackson up. distant I'll listen I'll talk to this one okay. so I'm speaking on stewardship this is the time of year we have our our pledges and so on so I looked in the Oxford dictionary for the definition quote the job of supervising or taking care of something such as an organization or property that doesn't sound like stewardship in a church so I went to Peter like good st Peter, 1 Peter 4, verse 11, uh, verse 10. Like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift each of you has received. That seemed a little better. Fourth Street has been through some cloudy and foggy and stormy times. But our path has brought us to warmth and sunshine. Uh, I believe, and I believe many of you have maintained hope and faith that we would arise. God has carried us to this point, and and um, and I think think we're, we're we're blessed in that. But also. Our world is enduring storms and clouds now. It's hard for us to see a path to safety as humans, a path to justice for all, to end poverty, to end racism, a way to save our world from the destruction that we inflict upon it as humans. So much work God has for us to do. And yet, there's so much work that we have to do, yet despite that, I believe Fort Street has promise. I believe Fort Street can make a tremendous change in our community and in our society. We have a precious core of people who are committed to doing these things. A precious core of people that get, can get things rolling and if we get things rolling, others will help us keep it going. To anxious children, Fred Rogers said, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. We can be amongst help the helpers in the world. And in doing so, we can be a beacon to others who help. Stewardship is a time for each of us to help advance God's agenda. This is a time to think deeply, pray fervently, and find what you can give joyfully to God's work. This is about money, and this is about sharing talents, and this is about discerning what God will have us do. God needs us to consider all these things at all times, but especially now, during this time, when we as a congregation focus on stewardship. So as your pledge card, so on your pledge card, designate a talent or two, a dream or two, and the money that you pledge to God's work. And in Jesus' name, let's give well. Thank you. Thank you for that. Dr. Jackson, I, uh, I know we didn't talk about this before, but actually we're going to do a series of sermons, probably three of them, and if you'd like to offer one, I mean, I saw you had notes, he had a lot more to say there than what he actually said, and you had scripture verses, so if you're interested, you know, 
we could share the pulpit. <laughs> that was great. Thank you. Thank you. Well, in honor of All Saints Day, the Callis family has brought these wonderful flowers so that we might remember loved ones who have gone before us. We thank them for that beautiful gift, and we also invite you, if you are here in person, to take one home in memory of a loved one and let it be a living reminder of the ways that those people continue to impact us today. So Open Door is going to reopen its doors this, uh, this Thursday, yeah. And it is a cause for celebration. It's also a cause to ask for help. I know we're in a pandemic and volunteers are hard to come by, but I think they're still looking for people to come around and to help volunteer at Open Doors. We invite people back inside. They do have a detailed plan for how they'll keep people safe. They've been working through that plan, and Trish is going to keep everyone as safe as possible, but we still need people there to staff and to help out uh, with the various things that come up. And if you've ever helped with Open Door, here's what I've learned. You just kind of show up and you do what you're told, right? And, and needs arise and people ask you questions and you just go. And so uh, it's, it's a beautiful time. It's a great program and we do need your help with that. Another thing that we need help with is uh, with technology. So we've got a lot of new things sort of happening here at Fort Street. We've got cameras going, we've got uh, I think new cameras being installed and we're looking to train people on that so that we can begin uh, helping out. And so if you have any desire, interest, any talent that you'd like to offer, um, please know that we are looking for help in those areas. So. As we are reminded by Rob that we have been gifted by God first, we invite you to give back through time, talent, and money. And know that if you are here in person, instead of passing offering plates and passing germs along with it, we are doing it a little bit differently. So we invite you to drop your offering in uh, the plate as you exit. And if you are at home, or even if you are here, know that it is also always an option to give online. So look for those links on our website and Facebook and give generously. Okay. Um, so Fourth Street... Um, Huh? Is, is this on? You're good. Yeah, yeah okay. we're on, so I hear it. Okay, so 4th Street is um, gaining more leverage on social media. So 4th Street is now on Instagram, um, at 4th Street, um, uh, at 4th Street Presbyterian Church. Um, so follow 4th Street. Yay. <laughs> we're moving on up. Um, today, we are having an online coffee hour. Uh, for next week, there will not be any um, coffee hour online, but then it will pick back up on November 15th, right after church, on Zoom. Okay. Thank you. Well, as we prepare to go, let us remember that we are first citizens of heaven that we are called to be God's loving people in everything that we do, as we engage with politics and with one another, and as we walk through life. Yeah. Friends, as you go, especially this week, know that God sees you. Know that it's okay to stop, take a breath, listen to the sound of silence. Know that God is smiling down upon you, and know that you're loved and that your life truly matters. Amen.